Hey everyone, it's 3 o'clock. Um, my name is Ian Boy with North Carolina State University Libraries. Um, I'm just going to get started this week with a stream. Um, this one, the subject of the stream is going to be sculpting minis for 3D printing. Um, and this idea kind of came about because we have a lot of users in our makerspace that use the makerspace and the 3D printers for either miniature gaming or print tabletop miniatures for role-playing games like D&D. And a lot of times those are like kind of pulled from the internet, like they'll find a file online and they'll grab that and print it off on our printers, which is, um, which is fine, you know, as long as it's fair use. Uh, but it's kind of fun to make your own and then be able to be able to do this yourself. So what I thought I would do today is uh, start one second, let me just my audio. What I thought I'd do today is kind of show you how you can get started doing this kind of stuff and what kind of programs you can use and the kind of process you can use. So you'll look and see what I've got open up on my screen right here is a program, um, a free browser-based program called SculptGL. Uh, what it is is it's basically a sculpting program. Um, if you've looked up any, you'll know that there's ones inside of Blender, uh, there's one called ZBrush that's proprietary, um, but I like using this one, especially if you're just getting started kind of learning something, but it also is fairly powerful, especially for being a browser app. So you can find this by googling SculptGL, um, but I just wanted to kind of showcase what, what you could do with it. If you open it up, you're going to kind of see what I've got here, which is just a sphere, you know, in a blank scene. Um, if you grab your brush, you can start drawing on it, you know, or do whatever you need to. I made sure that my let's see, accumulate, yeah, made sure that my tablet works this time. Thanks for throwing that up in the chat, so you can see. Kind of, you can just kind of get started, like making something out and drawing, you know, basically whatever you want using the sculpt brushes in here. Just kind of an example of like kind of what you can do, you know, how, how the program works. Uh, I'm not going to be jumping straight in, though, to sculpting on a sphere today. What I kind of want to show you is if I'm doing this kind of process to create a finished product, um, I do like starting on a sphere, just to kind of showcase, like, how you can take a uh, ball of clay, you know, in quotation marks, because obviously it's virtual. But you can also start with... Um, what I call a, ba a base mesh. And if you're doing something um, like a character, which I'm going to be doing here on the stream today, uh, starting at least, starting one today, it'll probably take a couple of streams to get you to the finished product. But starting a character on st stream today, what you'll probably want to do is start with a base mesh. And I'm going to go ahead and clear my scene, take this out, and I'm going to import by going to this add at the top. And it's going to go straight to this folder I have with my assets, and I'm just going to grab this base mesh. Um, I pulled this off of a site called Polycount. If you're ever interested in doing any kind of 3D art, I would recommend uh, checking out Polycount. It's basically a big forum um, that is shared by professional 3D artists across the world uh, in every kind of industry, uh, particularly particularly game uh, game artists, you know, for video games. But uh, you find people from all disciplines there. It's a great resource and like going there and asking questions and learning from pretty much the best people in the world is just an amazing asset. Um, they have so, like a kind of like a Wikipedia in there and basically uh, they've got a collection of base meshes. So I just grabbed this uh, human base mesh uh, with shoes. You see the Vaughn shoes rather than toes. And I'm going to throw it into my scene. So looking at this, your base mesh, base mesh does not have to be super complicated. Um, basically you see that this is a pretty low resolution mesh. What's important is that you have all quads, because if you have a mesh with triangles, it's not going to divide very cleanly. Um, so anytime you're looking for a base mesh, just look for something that has the general shape of what you're going to pursue. Uh, but also look for something that is mainly constructed out of quads. Ideally, it should be entirely quads, but um, are there non-humanoid forms too? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so like if you're looking for any kind of base mesh, I would just input what uh, whatever you're looking for, like horse base mesh, um, you know, snake base mesh, that kind of thing. 
And usually if you just put it into Google, uh, like you can find free downloads. And the nice thing about it is it doesn't have to be a super detailed or great model. Like it can be very basic because we're gonna really improve upon it. It's meant to just be a base, like to give you, you know, the kind of the proportions and the start uh, to begin, to begin sculpting on. Um, I guess the more specific you get with it, like, you know, if you were looking for like a chinchilla base mesh or something like that, um, the harder it's going to be, you know, you'd probably be better off like starting with a rodent base mesh or something like that, or rat or mouse, and then morphing it into a chinchilla. But like, yeah, there's, there's tons of base meshes out there, uh, for fantasy creatures and, um, real life ones as well. So, and then even if there isn't one, you can usually find a real world equivalent. Um, like, you know, you wouldn't think about it, but you know, you can even combine base meshes using the uh, remesh feature inside of SculptGL. So I could remesh, like, I could grab something like a, um, like a snake base mesh and something like a, you know, like a, like a gorilla base mesh and maybe like a, like a rat, and you know, kind of create like a dragon out of that. And, you know, like you can just like start start your process this way because you know it doesn't really have to just be like what you start with like uh, the whole idea is just to improve upon something that we have so I'd recommend you grab one of these to start with um, you can start from just a sphere but if you're if you have an idea in mind this will just give you such a leg up on starting um, the nice thing about this too is that you can kind of move your proportions around so like, let's say that like I didn't want to make a human, you know, like this is a humanoid base mesh. Um, but let's say I wanted to make something, you know, like um, like a halfling or a goblin, you know, something like that. If we're talking about fantasy, something that's like kind of got a diminutive stature, right? Like in, isn't the idea. But what you can do is because you have control of the proportions in here, is that you can start, you know, scaling and modifying what was a humanoid form you know, down into something smaller. Like, already, you know, we're, like, changing the proportions to a pretty good degree. Like, these aren't really humanoid proportions anymore already, um, because, you know, like, you think of um, proportion in terms of head heights, usually is the way to, we think about it in art, you know, like, uh, humans are about seven and a half heads tall, uh, generally. There's some background static. Hold on one second, let me make sure my audio is okay. One sec. Sorry, just bear with me for a second, everyone. Let's see, Mike Auxiliary, we'll say okay. Make sure everything's plugged in. Sorry if, if like I'm blowing you out here at all. Uh, one, two, three. Just see if that's any better. Desktop audio is muted, mic box audio. Is that any better at all? Yeah, good, good, good. Just making sure. Okay. Yeah, thank you for uh, getting me mod. Just making sure. Okay. I can't listen to my own stream. Maybe I should uh, put in some headphones and everything. But real fast, what I was just talking about here is that by modifying the proportions, you know, just inside this base mesh um, to something other than seven and a half heads tall you can start really creating like, you know, like kind of fantastical creatures, like, and then I don't have to just use my move brush in here. Like I could also go into my transform tool and like, I can kind of squash things down. Like, let me show you what that looks like. So I can just use the scale in here. Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty common, you know, like, so we can like start adjusting the scale even more, you know? Um, so measuring in heads is a pretty common uh, unit of measure in kind of art fields like seven and a half is generally the accepted like that's how tall generally a human is in heads uh, obviously it's different you know a baby is about like three heads tall three to four heads tall as you grow you know into adulthood you go up to like five six heads uh, and before you become like a, an adult you know your head shrinks you get bigger uh, so proportion is one that's one way to think about it uh, you see it a lot in a lot of examples um, most people do humans as eight heads tall. Uh, the the more heads you make a person, um, like the the more statuesque they start looking. Like the David is closer to nine heads tall. You know, like um, Michelangelo's David. Um, 
I know people who've gone even higher than that. Uh, keep in mind as you go taller proportionally, you also have to go wider as well usually. But like um, to create, you know, kind of like demigod, you know, statuesque looking people, you just like increase the proportions. So it goes both ways, uh, but we can shrink down here a bit too. So right now I'm just modifying. And so we can just use the scale function to do this broadly as well. Something to keep in mind though is that your head's gonna shrink as well, so you might have to blow your head back up. But it's a good way for kind of changing up your proportions as you work. Okay, and then if you want to just make one section bigger, uh, a good way to do that is grab your inflate brush and kind of just push it out. It's like a little too much. Let's get in here, just make sure we've got it. I'm going, yeah, I'm going very closely. Let's turn this intensity way down. Okay, yeah, that looks a little better. So you see, just by setting this up, you can kind of create um, just like a new model. Even though it's a humanoid, the proportions are no longer, you know, kind of what we're familiar with. So you can start creating fantastical smaller races, you know, like uh, halflings, goblins anything along those lines. I'm gonna make the hands a bit smaller here. Do this. Yep. Um, I'm not gonna concentrate on the hands for a long time, so I don't need to be touching them up too much right now, but it's just something. Hands also, you know, definitely affect your proportion. Um, Something like a halfling would have bigger hands than a human would, but you can't you know, keep them the same size. You have to scale them down a little bit if you're thinking about it that way. I'm also going to smooth this out a little bit just to make sure everything's a little relaxed. Uh, make sure your smooth is way down at this point because your mesh is very low resolution. It's only got 900 faces, if you can see that up in the corner. So I'm just making sure that everything is relaxed and nothing is standing out too much at this point. Let's get his feet back under him as well. So we're gonna put his feet back under him. I'm gonna kind of clean up the shins. I'm gonna leave his big feet because typically that's like something you see, right? You see like in fantastical creatures uh, yeah, that are kind of short, they have these large feet. And you'll notice as I'm going, uh, I'm just always kind of rotating around my model. Just get in the habit of doing that because you're working in 3D, you need to be able to view your model in three dimensions. Um, so for this reason, you just always wanna be tracking around, kind of looking at multiple angles um, because what looks good in one angle uh, may not look good in another. So I'm just cleaning them up a little bit after I've jerked them around. Okay, cool. And then once you get to, you know, kind of a proportional area that you're happy with, you can kind of start, whoops, sorry about that. You can kind of start doing some more detail work. Like this is the very, you know, base level right now. But right here for my topology, what I'm gonna go ahead and do is subdivide this uh, a couple times, a time or two. And the reason for that is if you wanna start adding detail to it, let me go back down real fast. If you want to start adding detail to your model, what you're going to find is, let me get my sculpt brush. What you're going to find is that you get very like jagged um, or low resolution stuff, you know, because you only have a few polygons to work with, right? So you want to make sure that as you do this, you may have to go up a little higher. And that's what I'm going to kind of, kind of do here a little bit. You don't have to go too high to start. In fact, I'd recommend against going too high. You wanna kinda of keep things simple, but you may need that detail. So I usually go up to about three or four off the base to start with. And you can always like alternate between the subdivision levels, right? Like you don't have to stay in any one. Uh, and just as a teachable moment, uh, all what subdividing does, as the name implies, is it multiplies each face on your mesh into four smaller faces. So what started as one large a uh, square polygon became four polygons, which became 16 polygons, if you counted it. Every time that you increase it, it increases by a factor of four. Uh, this is exponential, so just keep in mind that if you, uh, 
go too high too fast, you're going to run up against more polygons than your computer can probably handle. Uh, or the application can, I should say. It, it is browser-based, after all. So when you get started, I like doing a little bit of musculature here um, at this point, but you don't have to, is the kind of thing. Um, I think this is kind of a throwback, you know, to anatomy and playing around with anatomy. But remember, most of the time your models are probably going to be wearing some kind of, you know, clothing if they're not animal. Uh, is there a limit to how large the polygons can be? Yeah, absolutely. So like, so it's how many, you know, um, so the polygons, like, um, the poly count is kind of what I'll refer to it because uh, saying like how large the polygons are makes me think of, you know, like like individual faces, in which case like lower would be bigger, right? Like so if you went down to one, you know, you have these giant polygons and if you go, they're getting smaller, right? So I'm going to say the poly count uh, is to clarify. So if your poly count gets very high, um, a couple things are going to happen. One is your application might start running slower because your computer is going to have to compute more faces at any given time. When you use your brush, uh, it's going to have to displace more. Like, let me just show you real fast. Let's go up to something really high. Um, we'll stay here for right now. So this is over 200,000 polygons. So at this point, you'll see that I get a lot of detail. I'm wondering. Let me try going up one more time. If I crash it, it's fine. We'll start over. But uh, I just want to see. So it's going to even give you a warning. So it's going to say, hey, the next one's going to reach about a million polygons. If you know what you're doing, click again on subdivide. We're going to say yes. It might crash the, the, the application, but let's see. I think you can do it. All right, cool. So it looks like we're in. So something you're going to find when you do this is sometimes you're going to start seeing slowdown like on your model as you move it around. It's actually handi handling it very well. I'm like, I'm pretty impressed but you'll start getting slow down. And then the thing that also will happen is you won't be able to uh, smooth things out very well. The reason for that is, is you have a smooth brush. And what it does is it's basically displacing the polygons based on their proximity to each other. But now your polygons are so close together that when you try to go back in and smooth them, it's a lot harder to do. No, it doesn't look slow at all. Yeah, I'm actually very impressed. Uh, Sometimes it will slow down though. It also, if you have um, multiple objects in your scene, like uh, like if I had multiple, you know, one million polygons in my scene, um, that might be an issue. Uh, so it's just something to keep in mind that like it can slow your thing down, it can crash it. And there's one more thing I wanna show. I don't know if I can show it quickly because it's more of like a long-term problem, but like things start looking lumpy if you start too high. Uh, and the reason for that is you can't smooth out everything that you need to. So let's like, so let's say I go up to like level five, like I'm on here and I'm start sculpting. You can see that like my brush, you know, looks organic. It looks nice, but let's say I want to go in and start smoothing this out. All of a sudden you see that it takes a lot of effort, you know, to smooth out these shapes. Um, obviously I can increase the intensity of my brush, of my smooth brush. Like, and that will help some, but like, if you keep going up even higher, let's just go up one more time and see if I can show this. So if I go up even higher, you know, and then start doing it, like every time you subdivide, it starts getting harder to smooth out this detail. Um, and what happens is that uh, if you do this long enough, you start getting this like um, lumpy look to everything because you're not really smoothing out any of that like sharp detail on there. So I always recommend starting as low as what looks good would give you enough detail to look good. Um, just because it's hard to smooth back a step. So one sec. Um, if you're working with multiple subdivision levels though, you can get around it because you can always step back down, you know, to a lower level and you can smooth it out. Yeah, but you notice like if you've got here, you've got like the, well, maybe you would little lumpy goblin, like if you were doing it, like that might be exactly what you're looking for. But you'll notice every time I go back up, I have to smooth at every step because there's still that high level surface detail. So I had to go through and smooth on three sub levels right there, which isn't what you want to do is pretty slow workflow. Um, so I recommend starting low and then working your way up as you need more details. So just to get started. Um, another thing that sometimes I like to do and that you can keep in mind is sometimes I like separating the head from the rest of the mesh and combining it later. The reason I do that is because um, your humans look at heads, right? Like people look at heads first thing. We can all recognize like the head straight off. 
So it's good to put like some extra attention into the head for that reason. Um, you know, like you can mess up anatomy pretty bad on your model itself, and like it, people won't be able to tell the difference. Is kind of the idea. Um, but if you mess up the face and the face looks weird, uh, it's a lot easier for people to just look at it and be like, that face is wrong. They may not be able to tell you why it's wrong, but um, but they, they'll be able to tell. So sometimes because if I want to give the face more attention and kind of work on it by itself, um, I'll actually just chop it off and work on them separately and then combine them at the end. But I think for this one, we can kind of work on the full body. So real fast, I'm just going to kind of go in and I'm going to do some proportions. Um, and this is usually how I start any of these. I've already, you know, made some big proportion changes but it's kind of time to think about like other ones. Like right here, this guy's got pretty broad shoulders, probably broader than I want. I want my kind of a more diminutive, you know, kind of look to it. So I'm gonna just start making these changes. And what I do this with is just the move brush. Um, so at this point, I'm not even doing like really any sculpting. I'm just kind of sliding around features kind of to the point I want them. When you do this, remember I said you might want to be lower. I'm gonna step down a little bit. Um, I'll just kind of move and I'll kind of smooth stuff out a little bit. So I kind of move and smooth. Uh, my smooth is pretty intense right now, so I'll turn that down. And then if I see something else I want to change, like I said, I'll grab my smooth brush. I'll just slide it in, move and smooth. So it's something to talk about while I do this because it's not always the most interesting process is you don't need to get too caught up in the fine details of your model. And I'll talk about that in a little bit why. So kind of the idea, if you're, three, if you're making models to 3D print, um, you want to make things a little chunky. And the reason you want that is because it's hard to capture all the detail of your sculpt like in, in a 3D print. Uh, just because you, know, you can only get so high on resolution uh, fine features will break off like if you have a really thin part like it may snap so I like to keep things a little a little chunky when I work with stuff and I don't kind of worry about the small details as much uh, as I would if it was just going to be you know like viewed in a browser or something like that or viewed in VR or in a game engine or something so as you work don't be afraid to keep things um, chunky on your model and kind of keep the details bigger if you can Okay, this is looking closer. I think his back needs some work. And you can always come back and change this as you go. You're going to see as I start working on here, I'm going to change this like uh, lots of times as I work on things. Uh, you'll kind of add some detail somewhere. Something won't look quite right. So I come back and I change it up. Yeah, a tabletop mini is pretty small. Um, it depends on the scale that you're playing in, but you know, like usually you're thinking around three inches two to three inches maybe smaller you know like in that range um, so because you're working so small you won't have a lot of resolution to capture you know all the details of things so you really want to make your uh, details count is what I'm saying yeah tiny features won't show up like they won't be captured by the printer or people won't see them so as you go through things just keep that in mind uh, try keeping your details big and make sure that everyone can see them from a distance. Uh, you also notice I've got them in kind of a default pose. This is something I like to do with all the models I work on. Uh, the idea here is that I have the advantage of using symmetry when I have them in this kind of T pose. Uh, and I'll kind of work them to a base level, you know, like where I'll block in like clothing, I'll block in like um, some basic muscles and things like that. But, um, but I'll keep them in the T-pose while I do that because I can use this symmetry. Um, as soon as I put them you know, in, an, in a non-symmetrical pose, you know, where I don't have a good line of symmetry down the middle, I'm going to lose all the advantage of that. So I like to try and benefit from it while I have it. Um, so I'm going to leave that on for now and then I'll pose him in the pose he would be like on the base later. So starting from here. I want to show you something that you can do. So you have this brush in here called the masking brush. And what you can do with this is basically mask out areas that you don't want to be affected. So like if I was sculpting, whoop, 
let me get grab a different brush so if like I was sculpting really you know like on here like anything that I've masked off won't be affected which is a great use of it um, but it's not what I want to show you what you can also do with it let me go to a higher subdivision level one sec if you go to a higher subdivision level and I like kind of start putting in an area I went to a higher subdivision level because if you can see this uh, affects like vertices individually so you have a lot you know cleaner result if you put this on what you can do with this is start with your base model and you have this extract button it's under the masking brush so you have this extract option and a thickness slider so as you're making things like armor or clothing or anything like that or you know um, anything that needs to adhere to the surface of your model you have this extract option on here and what that's going to do is it's going to take the masked area that you've put in and it's going to extract it as a new mesh so now oh man yeah it's pretty intense probably at this point I would actually even remesh it let me go ahead and do that so now at this point oof, let's turn up my turn up my turn up my smooth so at this point you can now sculpt on this and use it like another model so like if you wanted to make like something like a breastplate on here you totally could I'll just smooth out the edges real fast and then you can kind of build up geometry you know that's adhering to the surface of your model in this way and it's super useful and it comes in super handy I'm not going to be using it quite yet right now um, I'm just going to delete that out of there but you definitely can so what I'm going to do is just like I said earlier I'm just going to put in some base musculature on him while I do this it's always nice to talk about like like anatomy as an artist and like do you need anatomy you know like and the answer is um, kind of you know like you, you kind of um, it helps if you are kind of familiar with basic shapes you know that make up the body you know things like people need a rib cage it's good to know where like major muscles are but the the other thing is is that you don't really need to let me go back because you can always just you know follow a reference and kind of sculpt what you see and I also always recommend that is that like following a reference um, finding images of things that you want to look at and then going off of those anatomy is just really important because it gives you a kind of a language for you to use that you can then make conscious correct decisions about where to put things um, I'm not the greatest artist like I'll just say that like right off the bat um, and the reason I think the biggest thing that I think that uh, you know kind of shows that besides you know my work being bad right is that it takes me a long time to move things to the correct position and what I mean by that is um, I can spend a lot of time you know like putting stuff in place you know brushing things in and I can tell that it doesn't look good but I couldn't tell you why right and the reason for that is because I don't have a you know a great mastery of anatomy eventually I will get there because I'll be able to just move things around you know to the point to the point where they do look correct but it's almost cause I'm doing it by trial and error rather than knowing you know why I should do why I should be doing that so you know the more you know this stuff uh, the faster you can sculpt like in the faster you can do this because you'll just be like okay you know I've got it I've got it in my mind uh, I know where things need to go and you can put them there like quickly so like anyone can do this but you know like um, the more you practice the better and faster you get at it uh, I think that people you could if you you know spend a lot of time on something I think you could get something that looked really good you know if like even if you said like I can't draw you know like I can't do anything artistic and you like you probably can uh, you just have to you know put the time in and you know use reference to get there um, 
So just something to keep in mind that, you know, like, you don't have to be good at art to do this, but it does, it does make it go faster. Let's see, anatomy is complicated. Uh, human bodies, human bodies are complicated and everyone can tell when you mess up because everyone knows like it's some, that's like what I was telling you, like eventually you will stumble on, you know, like the right, the right things, like you will stumble on like the right points. It's because everyone knows like what a body like is supposed to look like. Like when we so see something that looks weird or alien, we're like, ooh, what, what's wrong with that? You know, like what's wrong with that person? Uh, and it's because, you know, like, um, it's because instinctively we've been looking at humans all our lives. Like, you know, since we were a baby, we've been surrounded by humans. So like, we know what muscles look like, you know, and if we see something that's not wrong, we might not be able to tell you why it's wrong, but uh, we know it's not right. So that's what I'm saying. Like if you, you know, just stare at your model long enough, you'll be like, well, that doesn't right. You can just like push it, you know, into another position and it will like, it'll change how it looks and you, you'll kind of get a good idea about it. Okay. And I'm just putting in some base stuff, kind of a roadmap for me. You'll notice that like, um, I'm going a little extreme here. And the reason is, is like, I can just knock it back down. You know, like I can always smooth out anything I have and going a little heavier makes it so that I'm sure that like I hit it, you know, like in there and then I can just smooth it back out and he doesn't look, you know, like too buff or anything. It's just, you know, kind of where I want it and I kind of have my road map. Okay. So just putting in things back here, just back muscles, lats, latimus dorsi, trapezius muscles up by your neck. Like I said, you don't need to know what any of this is called, but you do need to know kind of like, you know, that it goes there. And it doesn't even have to be in here. I just, this is just usually my sculpting, you know, kind of uh, workflow is like I go in put basic things in place because it makes me feel better about how everything's looking later. But like, again, a lot of this won't show up. It's just, you know, kind of the workflow I go through. And it also kind of gives me a warm up, you know, like for uh, things I need to do earlier or later in the model, you know, things that like will count for more. So it's good to, it's good to warm up. And that's kind of what we're doing here because this is, you know, the real, the, the real Dark Souls, the real sculpting, you know, kind of is starting here. So it's easier to do this kind of low stake stuff. Okay, and then I'm gonna use my move brush again and I'm gonna knock this back a bit. Also, don't worry about like, you know, going too big when you start because it's very easy to, to scale it back. Let me go down a little bit. If you need to make big changes, like here I'm moving his entire leg, it's actually a good idea to step your resolution down a little bit. Uh, the reason for that is, is it's a lot easier to make changes without things becoming lumpy. And then you can always go back up to put in details later. So if I need to do any big moves, I always make sure I drop my resolution before I do that. Okay. And we could go in and start messing with his face as well. I mean, like... Honestly, like the face is going to give him most of the character. Um, I'm just holding off a little bit because I don't want to go in too early and work with it, but we can like put in some basic stuff here. So we're not just like looking at a formless void for a second. Make sure you're not on your move brush. So real fast. Doing some eyeballing. Um, the head, you know, you might have seen this in art stuff, but the head, draw a line down the middle of it. It's easier, you know, because we have symmetry on. And then go in about half that right here. And that's where your eye sockets are going to be. Just things to remember. I'm going to go down a little bit. Okay. Um, your eye socket also... Um, Kind of looks sad your sc your skull like the orbital socket in there kind of has this downward slope so you can keep that in mind when you're doing brows and things like that like make your make your skeleton look sad <laughs> is, is how i remember it okay 
And right now we're just putting in a little bit of a map. You know, you have your cheekbones. Let's see, what are they called? I forget, your occipital bones? It's hard, because I always like, um, because everyone knows, you know, like what a cheekbone is. I think they might be called that, but I could be, I could definitely be wrong. I'm not the best at anatomy. Like, I'll, I'll just say, I'll just say straight up. From a formless void to a sad skeleton, exactly. And again, like when I say, um, you don't have to start like with the skull. Like that's something I do because um, it's kind of given me the practice, you know, to start. And it like makes it easier for me to place my features later on. Yeah, if we zoom out real fast, you know, like this little skull, this little skull boy. But we'll go ahead and put uh, his mouth in here because you kind of have you know like think about like how a, ske a skeleton looks you kind of have like a muzzle you know on the front of your face where your where your teeth come out and your jaw comes out um, we might emphasize that even more because I think we might make him a goblin but we'll have to wait and see so I'm gonna scale this back okay and then we're gonna start adding some features in here so a big one is going to be his nose Zygomatic, yeah, that's it, because you have your zygomatic arch. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, again, like, it's not really important to know every word in here. Like, you don't know how to have to know every bone and every muscle. You're not going to be a doctor. Even if you're a really good artist, um, most of them don't know, like, every bone because they don't have to depict, you know, like, the, the inner workings. Uh, they just have to show what's on the surface. There's a big difference between, like, artistic anatomy and, like, um, like medical anatomy you know like uh, artistic anatomy is a lot easier because you're depicting not uh you know like saving lives and like having to remove them yeah zygomatic bone so like it, even even artists kind of have kind of have this surface understanding like even people who are really good at it you know um you don't because there's just no reason like there's enough things to practice in art as is you know you don't need to you know go deep into into things that no one will ever see Unless you want to, of course, depict those things, in which case you should. But so real fast, we're gonna start giving him a nose. This is usually where I go next. And right now, it does not matter at all what your nose looks like. You just need like a nose-like feature. What I'm gonna do in here is grab my move tool, and I'm gonna start pulling it out. And this is where you're really gonna define the nose. Again, I'm feeling I'm feeling a goblin for this guy. So I'm gonna start here. Um, if you ever are doing things like stylized features like this, usually you can take you know kind of a base nose and just like, yeah, goblin sounds good to me. Um, you can kind of take base features and just exaggerate them. So like. I know that my nose is going to need to have a bridge, you know, it's going to have a break in it right here, it needs nostrils, but I can just like stretch it out. You know, this is like where you can have some fun. And since we're doing a goblin, I also kind of want to give him this heavy, heavier brow, I feel like. So we're going to go in here, I'm on my brush still, and we're going to really thicken this up. Kind of create like a heavy brow ridge in here. So let me grab my move brush. And right now we're just kind of playing around in here. I'm gonna move this forward. Kind of give him, this is where you can kind of deviate from human anatomy a little bit. Um, so I can give him kind of like this more sloping forehead, which is more remis reminiscent of, you know, like a, like a primate or something like that. You know, more like like a chimpanzee. You can kind of play with it a bit. And always it's good to kind of zoom out and see what everything's looking like from, you know, like a distance. I think he's actually at a scale that's bigger than a goblin, so we might say he's a hobgoblin or scale him down later. But I think for right now this looks good. And then I'm going to give his nose some more character. 
because this is fine. You know, it's a pretty generic goblin nose, but like we can we can do better than this. So I'm gonna scale this in. I give him this big break right here. I'm gonna use the brush. And you'll notice something that's kind of going on right here is that as I work, um, you notice you kind of get some like artifacts in here. And the reason for this is because, you know, his nose is so much bigger than the flat face that I had him on. We're really stretching out the polygons. So to get around this, I can either go up another level, you know, and then I have more to work with, um, or I could remesh completely. I think for now, I'm just going to stay on here, but you can always step up if you need to step up another level. But for now, I'm going to kind of stay where I'm at and kind of work around. And this is kind of what I mean where, you know, kind of stay low for as long as you can and then go high because in the end, it'll look a lot cleaner. Okay, I'm going to get my move brush back again. We'll turn this off. Okay, and we're going to squeeze this in. Just kind of looking for that bridge. Again, there's not too many polygons to work with here, so I gotta be careful. Mm, not too bad, that's a little sharp. The tip of his nose is a little sharp. We'll go ahead and flatten it out just a little bit. Yeah, and I think I'm gonna smooth it a bit, but really turn that smooth down. Yeah, there we go. Something else you're going to find that as you do this, that um, your smooth gets very strong, you know, if there's a big gap, like a big distance between your polygons, so keep that in mind. Make sure you scale that intensity down if you're, you're using it in this way. Okay, so we're going to go in back with our brush. I'm going to start putting in his face. And I feel like you can see it, but like already we have a lot more character, you know, kind of when we started with. So I'm going to go push this in here. We're going to start working towards a mouth. We're also going to, I think, angle his features a little bit more. When I think of this, I think of, I think of like, you know, goblins having very pointed features. So. He's got a very round face right now. I'm just gonna kind of go in, step it back a little bit. You see like uh, how much how much we're losing, you know, as we step down. Like like this is kind of the idea. Like you get more abstracted each time. So let's go down to three maybe. I'm gonna start. And I kind of think of you know like the feature that I want the most. And right now it's this like you know really pointed chin. So I'm gonna just grab that. And then I'm going to kind of fit everything else around it. So again, this looks a little a little too pointy from the front. He's kind of got these jowls going on. So we'll go through here, kind of put up his jaw a little bit. And we'll bring this down. He still needs like a mandible though. So like, you know, we can't get too carried away, but I mean, but he might not, you know, like if it looks good, you know, like you can do it. Like I talk about, you know, anatomy, but in the end you're doing this, you know, kind of for you and to kind of mess around with it. So like, just keep in mind, you know, that like nothing has to be right, right? Like if it looks good to you and you're happy with it, you know, like that's totally fine. I feel like, you know, we get too caught up in like looking at other people's work and being like, ah, mine's not good enough, you know? well. Do this for your own enjoyment, you know, do this to give yourself something, you know, to play with that you made. You know, like it's, it's an important thing to remember. Like why you're doing this, you know, why to mess around. Okay, cool. We'll leave this for a second. I'm actually going to go out and grab his ears at the same time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go way down on my resolution because we're doing a pretty big grab right here. 
let's say maybe two. Two looks good to me. What I'm actually going to do is I'm going to mask off everything that's not his ear because I'm going to do a pretty big grab right here. Okay. Yeah, something like this. I'm going to leave this here because I'm actually going to generate the ear from pulling all of this out this way. But let me grab my move brush and then we're going to probably have to do this a few times. It's going to be some trial and error. Because it's really important just to grab it in the right spot. I also might have masked too much. Yeah, I think I did. I think I'm losing a couple, a couple polygons in there. So I'm going to go back in. And then just take off a little bit of this mask, just a little bit. And we're going to pull it out again. Let's get a big brush. Yeah, okay, that's not too bad. I'm going to grab this as well. Okay, cool, cool. These are kind of the times when you need a little more concentration, I feel like. Like, if I'm, like, blocking stuff out, you know, like, I can do, like, whatever all day, you know. But um, here I'm really thinking about, like, what kind of line, you know, like... Like if I were to draw on this, you know, like what kind of line am I drawing, you know, across the front? Because that's kind of how your character reads. Again, I want chunky ears. Remember, this is going to be for 3D printing. Um, these are, you know, something that's sticking out. So there's a couple ways to deal with this. Like you can do it like here, like I'm doing, but make sure that you've got a lot of mass behind it. Like you want this ear to be really anchored in his head. You can give him like these big lobes, you know, like out to the side. Um, you just got to keep in mind that this might be difficult to print and so if you're doing something like this um, Just keep that in mind keep it chunky uh, go in here. You can use the inflate brush like I can grab this real fast scale this down You can use the inflate brush You can see how I'm like just kind of like pushing everything out a little bit It's uh, it's pretty subtle. So let me make sure you can see it So you like right there so you can do that to give yourself, you know, more to work with. This is definitely a kind of a case when you have a feature like this that you want to be, you know, safer on the safer side. The other thing you can do is rather than sticking his ears out from his head like this, you can go back. Let's see if I can grab it. You can grab them and kind of something that you can do is just slap them against his head. Um, obviously this is kind of a different you know look so it depends on what you're going for but if you just kind of need big ears you can actually use his head geometry and now all of a sudden you don't have something sticking way out you know because that might need to be supported it might break off uh, so you, this is something that we'll do a lot kind of when we work with this is that if you have these like p small pieces or pieces that you know are sticking off just slap them onto his body like don't let you know like things come off of him um, like stick away from his body just like kind of slap them in place because when it goes to print you know what was you know like a like a four millimeter you know like overhang in 3d printing an overhang is just an object that needs to be supported as you 3d print you know that's built up is now like maybe a one millimeter overhang like right here on the edge so it's just something to keep in mind as you're 3d printing is that you can um, slap things against their body and it will make it a lot more secure and easy and make it a lot easier to be able to print. I do kind of want his ears to stick out so this is like an artistic choice but make sure you are making that choice for a reason um, because if if you don't have an opinion on it you always want to go with what will give you you know more security and what will read better but I'm gonna stick his ears out but I don't want to go too far. We'll just leave it like there for right now. Okay. I'm going to step back up my resolution a little bit. Yeah, not too bad. And now that I have some more resolution, I'm going to clear my mask. And I'm going to work on his ears just a tad. Um, ears are hard. Ears are hard to sculpt because we don't think about them. You know, like um, you have to learn the shapes if you want if you want to do the ears. So it's just something you need to go in and like look at look at ears kind of look at what makes them up. 
And then if you're abstracting ears, just make sure you know how you're doing it. So I'm just gonna carve into this a bit. Uh, this is something to touch on. If you're doing thin parts, like ears or anything like that, um, there is a chance you'll actually push through the mesh here and then come out the other side. Uh, so I'll show you if you are doing that, there is an important option in SculptGL that you can use that says thin surface, front vertex only. And this is a lifesaver to just check this um, whenever you're on something very skinny like an ear because it will only affect the front surface, the one that you're, the front vertex, the ones that you're sculpting on. It will not push through and do anything behind that. I don't think I'll need it now because again, we made his ears chunky. Um, but it's important to keep it in mind that if you ever get to that point. So just pushing in the ears, making sure to keep a little bit behind for that ridge. And I'm smoothing it as I go as well. I'm gonna go to a smaller brush right here, kind of push that in. Okay. I think that looks good. We'll keep stick with that for a second. Again, you want big features. Um, honestly, his nose is probably too sharp, if like I'm being honest with myself. So I'm probably gonna have to go in and inflate it up a little bit. So that's probably what I'm gonna go do right now. Uh, inflate or the brush tool works pretty well in this, this case. But all I'm doing is making sure that I have enough area so that when I 3D print it, and this is something like if you're if you're designing these like especially for 3D printing, uh, this is something that you just constantly like need to talk with yourself about, you know like do I have enough geometry here? You know like um, is this going to print well? And I think that this point of his nose actually was too thin, so I need to come back in here and thicken it up. One sec. All right, there we go. And it's kind of it's kind of cool to watch this come to life, you know like just watching it. Like, oh. it's cool to watch like something like be created and it's cool to do it yourself. You know, I always think about this kind of stuff as like, you know, being the ultimate character creator. You know, if you play video games or anything like that, you get to like drag sliders around and make a character. Well, this is like that, but you have complete control of everything, which is both very cool and very scary. Okay, let me drag that smooth down a bit. Yeah, I think that looks good. And then we're gonna go in here and work on his mouth a bit more. So how I go about mouths usually is I take the crease brush, which we have not used yet uh, for a good reason. Uh, you use the crease brush to draw thin lines into surfaces or you know sharp lines away from surfaces. It pinches and pulls simultaneously. Um, I don't use it if I'm not de detailing. Like I use it a lot like during the detailing step, you know, for like wrinkles and things like that. But I don't use it now because right now we're just blocking in. So what I usually do in this step is I go to a fairly high resolution and I kind of just draw a line. And I do this until I find a good place for a mouth. Like I do, usually do this a few times. And all I'm doing right now is just trying to size up where the mouth should be proportionally. Like, um, cause like you, the, the, the appearance of something changes a lot based on where you put the mouth. Like if you put it very high, it looks very different than if you like put it down here. And neither one of these really looks wrong it just like it just gives your character a very different feel so like um, so I encourage you to like play around with woo that went way bigger hold on yeah because my intensity popped up um, so I encourage you to like just like play around with this and kind of just see what happens when you put the mouth certain places because it will give your character a different feel uh, I encourage you to play around with all these and just kind of see where what happens when you put them put them in different places Hmm. Let's increase the intensity a bit more. So I'm just kind of looking at it. Kind of, it kind of goes with you know, kind of the personality you want them to have. Um, by placing, I think, by placing the um, mouth higher, you make them look more heroic. You know, it's kind of like that jutting chin kind of thing. Obviously, this is all subjective, but like generally speaking, um, they end up usually looking more heroic if you put it lower. You know, it's usually more of like a like an anxious, like kind of submissive look. So, in the middle, um, it's kind of about average. 
usually there's about one eye's dis distance between the um, bottom of the nostrils and the mouth so you can also put it conventionally but you don't have to right like you can put it anywhere so we'll kind of put it in the middle I think we'll just be safe yeah I think that's fine and then at that point if you want you can leave it at that because you can start building up stuff around it uh, or you can start changing details as you go so it's up to you um, I think what I'm going to do though is look at the face and I'm going to just make sure that everything is where I want it to be. And again, that involves going and grabbing your move brush. And since I'm moving things around, I am going to drop my subdivision level. For one, I think his head's looking a little weird. So I'm going to go back in and just kind of push this around a little bit. And you can make pretty big changes here, like especially if you do it on a lower subdivision level, because um, what will happen, let me see if I can show you an example. So let's go all the way down to one. And let's like move his head like really far forward like this. Hold on, I'm gonna sneeze. Maybe not, maybe, uh, I don't think so. Okay, I was gonna sneeze. But then what you do is if you go back to five, even though his head's been stretched out, all that detail has been uh, retained like all the high resolution sculpting you did has been retained. So uh, don't be afraid to you know make big changes like on lower subdivision levels because usually it will keep all the work you did. But right now, let's see. I think I wanna make his chin more prominent. So I'm gonna slide things back. Yeah, you can do goblin aliens, it's your mini. You can do whatever you want. You know, like that's the idea. And I'm doing fantasy, you know, in this because I think most people are like, you know, used to fantasy, but you know, it doesn't have to be like, it's your, it's what you're making, you know, whatever you want is good. Yeah. This feels a little bit better. Just looking at proportionally how things are looking. Not too bad. Looking kind of, kind of wise. Okay. And then I'm going to give some more attention, I think, to his brows. And a lot of this initial step is kind of like this, like you're kind of just moving things around, kind of seeing what works. Um, and the reason for this is if you get all this really solid now, it's going to pay big dividends later. Like further down the line, you know, when you're going through detailing and like adding stuff to him, um, it's going to be a lot easier if you're already happy, you know, kind of with the base that you're working on, your detailing. If you go back in and you're making changes every time, uh, like it just can get harder. Is basically basically how it goes so you want to be you want to kind of be happy with this but uh, keep in mind that you know keep in mind that you can still go back and make those changes it's just it's just good to nail it down okay let's see okay I think that's good for now we'll leave his face alone for a second I just wanted to come in and put something there uh, just so you can kind of see, you know, like how to get started and like now it looks, you know, more like the object that we're going to sculpt rather than kind of a faceless void. But um, just getting started right there, you can see. Let's go ahead and talk about something that most miniatures will have, which is some kind of clothing or armor. Again, I showed you earlier, you know, how you can use the um, extract tool, you know, to make that. And that's exactly what we're going to do now. It is good to do this on a higher topology um, because... I'll show you because it's dependent on the size of your polygons. So like right now we have very fine polygons. If I go in and, you know, start masking, you notice it's a pretty high resolution. You know, it's got a nice edge. It's got a nice gradient. If we go down to level one and try this, we have very large polygons. This is what it looks like. Like, like there's no detail, right, to extract here. So make sure that you do this at a high resolution. And let me clear my mask. Okay, and we'll go back up to level five. Okay, gosh, I've already spent an hour with you guys. Crazy. And then what I'm gonna do here is just kind of start making like a tunic, is the idea. And right now I don't need to be super neat. The idea more is just to like, you know, get something that vaguely resembles a shirt because we're going to fix it up and do all the detailing on it once we 
like have the geometry but it is good to have you know kind of a starting point yeah it's true I mean faceless voids so right now he's kind of wearing a muscle shirt but that's okay <laughs> we'll we'll adjust this as we go let's also knock down this collar a little bit okay start let's give him we'll go short sleeves because they're easier for here but again you can go you can go longer I'm just gonna kind of start with well, let's go a little longer we're gonna kind of start with something like a t-shirt to begin with and I'll kind of show you how you can begin and how you can start thinking about you know clothing because up there with like hair you know clothing is one of those difficult things you know it's hard to draw it's hard to sculpt so you have to just know where things go so I can tell you a little bit about how to get it done so real fast in order to extract it you have to go to your masking brush and you can decide your thickness and you can play around with it so I say extract that's pretty thick you know that's like a wool so we can dial this down is basically what we're gonna do so let's go maybe half of that just roughly so 0.4 that's looking pretty good again remember you want this to be a little chunky um, because chunky details are what's gonna print so however much that you think looks good you probably should go a little thicker just in general because that's what you need to do to make the details pop so let's go up a bit to like 6.65 and that looks pretty good to me. So we're gonna start with this. So the first thing I always do um, when I've kind of made this out, uh, the resolution of the shirt is based on the resolution of the mesh you just extracted it from, like down to the polygon. That's why you kind of get these edges on here is because it's really, it just like, it just pushed the polygons, you know, out of his body, you know, like straight from there. And then this was the knock, you know, the cutoff point. Um, so one of the first things I do when I get like a piece of clothing is actually I go to topology and I go and I remesh it um, usually to something lower because then I get like multiple levels uh, and I'll show I'll kind of show what that looks like so let's maybe let's go to 60 and see what that looks like and I'll go ahead and use the quad remeshing mm, it's probably too low you notice I'm getting holes in here and stuff so let's try stepping it up the nice thing is that you can always go back and try different ones so let's see how 80 looks it's getting a little better i think i still want to go a little higher let's go up to 100. remesh that okay mm, it's okay it's okay let me try my um let me try my triangle one too just to see It's these edges that I'm kind of looking at. That's why I'm like, eh, I don't know. I don't know about this. But the nice thing is, is you can go back and try this a couple times. Let me just keep going up. Okay. I think we'll stick with this. You know, we'll, 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 we'll go ahead and accept it for the content. All right. So this is kind of my remeshed shirt. And what I'm gonna go ahead and do is I'm actually gonna go ahead and give it another level. Uh, any object that you have in your sculpt GL scene, you can always subdivide and they always are different from the other ones. So you'll know which one's selected uh, by it's being highlighted. And then you can put any number of subdivision levels on here. So I'm gonna go ahead and just subdivide it once. Okay. And then I'm gonna go back down to my first level. And I'm gonna kind of smooth out these edges with my brush. Oops. Let me go back and make sure I'll go a little stronger. So intensity right here, just making sure I'm putting that up. Okay, we'll come around to the back. Um, it is kind of uh, sensitive to what it's grabbing, so just keep that in mind. If you ever click on the main mesh, it will add it to there, so just make sure you start on the object you want to start on. Okay, all we're doing is just cleaning up these hems. That's really like all we're doing. It's okay if they're a little frayed, that kind of adds to the effect, but I do want to clean them up a bit. Okay, so this looks good. 
we're still on level one. I'm also gonna grab my move brush. And this is just a starting point. From here, you can take this and you can start just moving it around as well. Uh, use a pretty big one. If you go too into him, it's gonna cut into his body. So just keep that in mind. Oh, he still has the, <laughs> still has the uh, mask on him. If you move it too into him, it's gonna cut into his body. So like I said, just keep that in mind. Um, but we can just kind of adjust it now to kind of whatever shape we want to. So what I'm kind of envisioning is, you know, he kind of has a rope sash tied around his waist and this is kind of flaring out from it. So I'm just kind of carefully making these changes. And again, it's a shirt. It doesn't need to adhere to his body directly. Okay. Let me clear my mask real fast. Cool. So we can make these changes as we go. So I'm just kind of cleaning this up a little bit. Going through here, fixing up his sleeves so they're roughly the same length. You can see it's kind of flaring out from his waist there. That's fine. If you want, you can make this way longer. Again, though, remember it's cloth. So it is going to kind of hug his body to some degree. And then I'll kind of start talking about uh, how, how cloth works and kind of what you can do to make it look more realistic. So the first thing that I would recommend if you're doing any kind of cloth is to grab some reference. Um, you can just go online and put in art cloth reference into Google Images, um, or you can get a book. Um, I like books, you know, for reference reasons. Uh, the one I use is just from an artist that I think just does a great job of doing teaching instruction. You don't have to buy a book, anything that you find out or check out a book. Uh, we are a library. Check out NC State Library for any of your art reference book needs um, or the design library. But, um, but I use this one book called uh, Dynamic Wrinkles in Drapery that's done by an artist named Bern Hogarth uh, who just does some phenomenal like instructional work and just does a great job. Like uh, just like kind of showcasing different kinds of wrinkles he had lots of great examples, you know, to everything. So if you're ever looking for anything like that, um, that's the one I recommend, but any of them are fine. Like you, you can find good reference anywhere. I just like books. So what I'm going to do is go here to my brush tool. Yeah, check it out. Something to note about wrinkles and drapery is they're usually not symmetrical. Um, usually you aren't going to have like wrinkles that meet in the middle, but we're gonna kind of fudge it a little bit here just to kind of show you. Cause I don't wanna break symmetry quite yet, but I kind of wanna show you what you're looking for. So anytime you're doing this, you're kind of thinking about where fabric would bunch up. And where it's gonna do this is on points where it catches on things. So for him, it may be like when he comes across his waist or from where it hangs. So another idea would be if it's hanging off his shoulders, like if it's feeling very loose, you know, you can kind of start making these ones right here. And what I usually do is because the fabric is hanging is I draw a stroke like this and then I take my smooth brush and I smooth out just the top of it, something like this. And then I'll just kind of go back over it. And this is another point where I'm very careful, you know, kind of to make my lines count and I'll just keep kind of building them up like this. And again, this is more of a texture thing. So right here, so right here, I'm imagining that the fabric is catching on his shoulders and it's kind of hanging down off of here. So that's how I'm kind of making my, making my sculpts. It's easy to get it like a, like bunched up in the middle like this. Let me just set back a bit. It's easy to get it bunched up in the middle like this because symmetry's on. So what's gonna happen is that you're gonna overshoot and go past, right? Like in the middle. So just be aware of that um, and watch out for it when, you, when, you, when you're sculpting yourself. 
Another thing about fabric is that, so I'm just gonna put this in. Another thing to know about fabric is that, I, I don't know, it's a good, it's a hard way to like, um, to talk it over, but like, it doesn't have, like it can be stuck in him. Like, like think about like, um, like Bernini. Uh, so Bernini is the one who does like all the crazy, like, like, you know, women with like veils over their face, you know, like in marble. And it's just like, how, how did he do that? Right? Like it looks magical. Right. And the reason for that, but the reason to think about it is that, um, this is a hard concept to explain, but like the idea is, is that that's all still one piece, right? So like everything is combined together. So you don't have to like actually sculpt the wrinkles, right? Like, you know, cause the fabric's bunched up and it's like folding over top of each other. You don't have to do that. You know, like um, really what you're doing is you're just making, you're just making like, um, like the appearance that it's folded over. So like the inside can be completely like solid, right? Like it's not, it's not really fabric. It's just that it looks like fabric because we've created the outside appearance of it. And I think it's actually easier to do in 3D and in clay than it is to draw, personally, um, because you just have to make it look like how it looks, <laughs> if that makes sense. So this is just how like reference can come in handy here. So again, we're bunching this up off his shoulder, and then right here in the middle is where it's hanging. And then this is kind of the point. And we could go in here and make him a hood too. We'll just see. So I'm gonna scoot this down. Yeah, things like this, if you can see that a little bit. You know, like, and these are, there's lots of different kinds of wrinkles. These are like hanging ones. Yeah, Bernini fabric sculpting. Yeah, check it out. Um, I can't do that. You know, like first thing I'll say right here is that yeah it's, it's amazing what he can do um but it's a good thing to like think about you know like well how did he do that and most of the time the answer is it's it's about you know it's an illusion right like you're not folding the marble over it's just um it's just you have the outward appearance of it so when you think about you know things like wrinkles and things like that you know you can just picture outwards how they look Another kind of wrinkle, you know, is uh, overlapping ones, and these are a bit harder. But let me see if I can showcase this. Uh, also, yeah, symmetry is where <laughs> is where cloth goes to die. Um, is another thing to keep in mind. So, usually I would turn symmetry off for this point when I really went into detail, but I kind of want to give you guys an idea because um, I probably won't do all of this on stream just because it's like there's so much detail here. But you also need to think about. Let me really turn up my smooth. Let's go down a little. Yeah, there we go. You also can think about, you know, like that cloth uh, folds on itself, you know, like it folds over on top of itself. So if you're doing like a fold like this, you just kind of need to think about. What this looks like against another one and see what we're going to do here is we're going to kind of use our move brush one second. Yeah, sorry for the the struggling and like explaining like how you do it but it's like it's like think about it like an illusion right like here i'm actually kind of folding the fabric over but you don't need to right that's the thing is you just need to make it look like it's folded over okay and then i'm going to take my mask brush and i can't state how important masking brushes are for doing fabric in this way for doing drapery but i'm going to kind of mask out that fold that i have and I'm gonna grab my move tool. And I'm gonna kind of slide it back over. Make sure I smooth this out. And again, this would not be symmetrical. <laughs> if you if you're doing this, um, my advice would be, don't make it symmetrical, um, because again, symmetry is the enemy of all cloth, but, okay, cool. That doesn't look, that looks pretty good. 
but then I'm just gonna kind of take this edge I have and I'm gonna kind of like push it if that makes sense so rather than go like on top I'm gonna kind of go towards the fold so let me see if I can draw this and give you an idea of what I mean I have to go pretty small here and kind of build it up I'm gonna smooth it out something else you might run into remember when I talked about ears before um, like ears being an issue that you might have to turn this on. Cloth sculpting is another one where you might have to activate this thin surface. Okay. And what I'm doing here is that the fold is coming from his armpit and the fabric is kind of bunching up together. And the more you can push this in towards each other, the better. That's why I was using kind of using this masking brush earlier. Let me is because if you can really push that fabric against the other fold, like if you can push these folds together, like that'll just do such a great job of selling it. So let me go back to my move. And again, there's no like perfect way to do this. It's really a lot of just like looking at reference, kind of seeing where things need to go and then kind of making sure you do it. It's just like something that you slowly build up. Oh, also. No, this is fine. Okay. All right. So I'm just kind of slide this around. So I'm going to go ahead and clear this and see where we're at. Yeah, that's not too bad. Uh, something to remember about like folds like this is that they usually hang in like. Um, almost like a TP shape, like a triangle shape. Oops, let me go back to my brush. So as you build them up, kind of remember that like, it's gonna kind of flare out at the bottom. Like it's gonna kind of bunch at the top and then at the bottom where there's more fabric, that's kind of where it's gonna push out. Make sure you start smaller at the top and then gather more fabric as you come down. It's not too bad, this pinch is pretty bad, but Again, symmetry, like I said, this shouldn't be symmetrical. And hopefully you're kind of getting an idea of like how, how things can like flow off kind of from the start. All right, so um, as you sculpt also, something that might happen is that like your fabric kind of gets away from you. Like right now, this has moved a little outside of like where I want it to be. So you can just take your move brush, make it large, and you can just kind of slide it back to the body. And like your, your wrinkles and stuff should be intact. Make sure I grab up here. Yeah, that's not too bad. We'll leave that for now. Um, like I said, a lot of what we're doing is just kind of blocking out at this stage. So, you know, just keep in mind that you don't have to go really far with anything. I just kind of want to show you an example of like how you can go about it. Okay, and then we're going to do the same thing, but we're going to put in some pants real fast. I mean, he could be pantsless, you know, it's his choice. But we're going to give him some, I think, just my artistic vision. Okay, and we're going to do it the exact same way. Just make sure. I'm going to kind of go above him for a second. Okay, that looks good to me. And then using your control brush, same thing, just hit extract. And you can generate some more clothes. Oh, also something to keep in mind is right now, um, I'm actually still has the shirt selected. It will do whatever you've masked. So if you want to keep your shirt thin, make sure that you uh, deselect it before doing this and then hit extract. Oh no, don't break on me, sculpt GL. 
Let's try it one more time. Okay. Oh no. Well, I'll just do both of them. Okay. Looks good to me. So what you see we have here is we actually extracted one underneath it. Um, because technically both things are masked. But it's not too hard to fix. All I'm going to do is click on the recently extracted one, highlight it so it's the only thing selected. I'm going to go through here and make sure this is masked out. One second, just bear with me. Okay, let's get it close. One sec, I really think you can do this. I just want to make sure. I just want to make sure. One second. Pardon me, folks. Bear with me real fast. If we can't do it, I'll show you a workaround too, so it's not a big deal. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Yeah, I don't know why I was messing up before, but we got it. Okay. So real fast, now that we have these, I'm going to deselect my mask. And again, same process that we did before. I usually take it and remesh it. I think we went up to 120 with this one. Let's see. Oop, not that. These. <laughs> Make sure your shorts are selected. So it's good advice for life in general, actually. Anytime you're doing things, just make sure your shorts are selected. So then I can come here. I'm just going to clean this up a bit with the smooth brush. Same process as above. You'll see. What, uh, yeah. It absolutely does. All, all art teaches life lessons. Especially sculpting is just the one I'm familiar with. All right, we're gonna move this down. And then you just kind of adjust your hem, you know, to however you need it. Uh, something else to keep in mind that if you're trying to make realistic cloth is that most things are going to like have motion at the bottom and what I mean by that is you're going to have like some parts that are up some parts that are down you know like some parts that are off to the side they don't make sense right now because there's no folds in it but like you know if these were loose and they had like wrinkles going across um, like it would make sense for them to have like some variance in, in the length right here at this bottom part. But right now we won't worry about it. Also, like uh, his, his pants are more form-fitting than his shirt is. So this is another good point to talk about if that you are doing clothing and you just want to make like some changes to it. Um, pants, because they're tighter on us than um, shirts are, like shirts are more loose, they're more flowing off our bodies. Pants usually adhere pretty closely to our legs. Uh, they're not usually very loose. So you have a different kind of wrinkle if you're using pants. You have something that I call tension wrinkles, and I think other people do. So rather than, you know, these like long, loose, you know, kind of drape wrinkles, you have these like tight wrinkles that are just formed from the tension of your pant like against your leg. Something like this. Just kind of kind of build them up. They kind of follow the same rules I was talking about earlier. You, they're kind of triangle shaped. You kind of start at the top and get, you know, progressively uh, thicker as you go down towards the wrinkle. But it's like it's a lot. It's a lot more subtle. 
if that makes sense. Yeah, something more like this. Again, I'll say it every time, like symmetry is where um, <laughs> clothing goes to die. Like, like wrinkle, wrinkle sculpting goes to die, but like, it's not too bad, you know, for it. Like for this, like, you know, you think about where like the fabric is like drawn tight across like the body. And then you kind of bring it all together. Here you probably have some more like underneath right here. Like here it's stretch tight because of like the quads in front, you know, going against it. Uh, in the back here where it's a little looser, you actually probably would have the same wrinkles we had up top, like these kind of drapery wrinkles. Hold on. So you kind of cut these in. I don't want to use my meat brush yet, actually. So you may have some of like, you know, the more like hanging wrinkles, like on, on the back here, especially like underneath the leg, because the fabric's like hanging down in the back right now. So just things to keep in mind, different, different things to keep in mind. Tension wrinkles, hanging wrinkles, um, anything can go to make cloth. But remember, the main thing to remember in a wrinkle is know where it's starting from, like where is the fabric tight, and then like where is it loose? Like where is it going to hang down from? So right here it's tied against his outside leg and it's hanging down against the inside leg. And then how you do this will make uh, a big difference like in how your cloth feels. Like right now his like pants already feel like a little looser in the back and honestly like tighter in the front, right? So like just kind of looking at it, also make sure you have a good shape. This is something where like the lines you make matter. You know, you need to have like a good arch and a good curve. And a lot of times, not always, but a lot of times they originate from the same point. Like one will be up there and then another one will hang like a little differently, like from the same point, but will hang lower. So like you kind of get a baggier, a baggier pant right here. Oops, I went inside for a second. Let's not do that. Okay, there we go. Again, if you need to, make sure that you um, activate that thin surface front vertex only. Like if you run into that, that's that's what's going to get you out. Okay, so just some basic, some basic fabric sculpting, kind of showing you some techniques that you can get to create wrinkles. You know, like on your models if you're working with cloth or doing things like that. Um, but just things to keep in mind. I think what we're going to do now is I'm going to take this guy and I'm going to finish up his face a bit more. He still doesn't have eyeballs and things like that. So we'll go ahead and do that for the next section. But for now, I just kind of wanted to show you like where we could get, you know, with sculpting the miniature, kind of where we started from too. Hold up, let's do this. I'm going to save it. Usually I do this at the end, but like, I think it's good since we're talking about it just to kind of reinforce like, you know, like how far we've come in this amount of time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of go ahead and save him. Let's see, I want to save him as, save him as a sculpt gel file. Okay. And then I'm going to clear my scene. Hopefully he's not gone forever. You always like, you know, take a deep breath when you do this. And then I'm going to bring in, yeah, only one point. Yeah, sculpting's fast. Sculpting is quick, uh, you know, like in, in comparison to a lot of other stuff, you know, so here's where we started. This was, this was our starting point real fast. We're going to take him and we're going to drag him off to the side. And then we're going to add an object. Where did you go? Are you in my downloads? I'm just going to throw this into my folder and we're going to go ahead and add it. So this is where we got like, um, so here's like the comparison, you know, and I just like, we can bring them down a little bit, you know, to kind of show, but like, it's kind of crazy, you know, like the difference you can make and then like where you can get to, you know, pretty quickly. And you know, this also could have been a lot faster. 
you know, like I could have um, not <laughs> not talked to you guys the whole time, not shown like teachable moments and things like that. But yeah, it's kind of crazy how fast you can get places, you know, with sculpting. Like you can really knock out like forms, especially if you're using a base mesh like I am here. Like it's it's kind of crazy the changes you can make and how um, how quickly and easily like things can happen. Uh, it, sometimes it is hard at first, you know, like because you're learning something new, right? But um, it is kind of crazy how fast things can appear and like develop. So real fast, I'm just going to clear my scene and bring him back in in case I've done anything funky with the symmetry. Come back in. Okay. And then we're just going to go from here. So I think kind of what I wanted to show going forward um, was something different. So sculpting is good for a lot of things. Um, like it's really good for anything organic. It's good for making, you know, like creatures and things like that. It's good for making uh, things like cloth, you know, things like that. Things that are organic, things that are flowing and natural. But um, if you wanted to make props and things like that, like say I wanted to give him like a dagger or something, uh, I would probably go into a different 3D application to do that. And that'll be kind of what I'm start doing next time, as I'll show kind of how to put them together and go into another application. But I also want to kind of highlight the strengths and weaknesses uh, of both when you start. So real fast, uh, I'm going to go in here and I'm just going to give him some eyeballs because it's something that he's missing. So I'm going to go into my scene. You can always add basic shapes inside of uh, SculptGL if you need to. They're just under here, under scene. And I'm just going to throw in a sphere real fast. And you see that suddenly he's turned dark and he is standing on top of a giant sphere. But we're going to move this up. Kind of where his head is. We're going to scale this way down because it's going to be his eyeball. Real fast. Okay. Sorry if I'm not talking real fast. I'm just placing it in his head. Uh, with this little doohickey, the outside ring scales everything uniformly. So that's what I'm using for most of it. We can bring this forward. And kind of position this where his eyes are. It does actually, I mean, you say that, but placing eyeballs does, like it takes me forever because it's so easy to mess up, you know, kind of when you put them in the head, like, because your eye isn't where you think your eye is because right now there's no like eyelid surrounding it. So for me, it's always hard to put them into place. Um, like it's something that I always have to actually spend a lot of time on. Here he's more stylized, so it doesn't matter as much. Like we can give him these gigantic eyes and it's totally fine, but like, Anytime I'm trying to place like a realistic eye in a head, it takes me forever. Um, your eye is roughly the size of a golf ball, and most of it is actually underneath uh, your brow, like your, your brow ridge right here. Like most of it sits underneath that because it's protected, right? Like that's kind of the whole point of having a brow ridge is in, in a lot of ways is to protect your eye, which is things to think about. Okay, kind of shove this in here. Um, um, this is where I talk about, like, if I was a better artist, this wouldn't take me as long. But because I'm not, I have to eyeball it, you know. Ha. Totally unintentional, but yeah, you, I have to eyeball it and kind of look at it. Alright, cool. There we go. And I think I'm happy with that placement. Uh, I generally only place one at a time, and I'll show you the reason for that in a second. What happens here is because that if I left click on anything, you know, that's another object, it's going to take it out of my scene. Um, something that I need to do and something that can help is since I have symmetry on is I can start sculpting in his empty eye socket right here. And that kind of gives me a starting point. I already think I want to go up a little bit though in my resolution. One second. Okay, there we go. Gonna go 
down a little bit. Yeah, I think that'll be good. Okay, cool. So I got a point where I can work on it. I'm being careful. I'm trying to preserve this crease right here. Uh, I can actually outline it with my crease brush, but it's a pretty important one, right? This one right here, where your eyelid like actually hits up against your brow ridge. I try to keep that if I can, because it's an important part of what makes an eye look like an eye. It's weird doing this like in the mirror. That's like how it feels. Okay. It's not too bad. We'll keep that for there and work on the bottom. Okay, sorry for the radio silence. This just takes some concentration. Smooth that out a little bit. Anything where you're like reliant on carefully placing a line, like always takes concentration. Yeah, that's not too bad. And then the next thing that you do that really helps make this pop, let me grab my crease brush. We might have to go up a level, we'll see is you go in with your crease brush and you hold your alt down because uh, you actually want the negative here. You want to bring the surface up rather than carve in. And you kind of like bring it up in a fine line around the edge of the eyeball. And this takes a couple of tries because you need to actually draw a pretty clean line. Because this makes like a lot of like the character of your eye. I kind of like this. Like I kind of like this like heavy lidded like sleepy look, but like I just want to see. Let's go back one. Like that's not too bad. You can do the same thing on the bottom, although usually you want to be a little more. On the bottom you usually oops. On the bottom you usually want to be a little more subtle with it. So I'm just kind of trying to use a light pin pressure here. Yeah, that's not too bad. Um as soon as you get done with that though, you're gonna go back to your standard brush in this situation. I've just finished <laughs> putting something in, so now I've got to move it around. I got to grab my move brush. I'm going to kind of also try to smooth out some of this area in here. Okay. You can also use your draw brush your brush brush, I should say. In other sculpting applications, this is usually called the draw brush or the clay brush. Uh, in Sculpt GL, it's just called brush, but they're all brushes, so, um, so sometimes I end up just calling it the brush brush, but I usually think of it as a claw, uh, sorry, a clay or a draw brush. So if I say that, that's what I mean. Okay. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, I feel like it's a weird name uh, for a brush, but it's fine. Okay, we'll go through crease. Um, again, you see that I actually am kind of running out of polygons up here. Like if you look around his like eyes in here, I actually could use some more. The only issue is that if I go up again, I'll be at 900,000. Um, so this is another one of the reasons why sometimes I split the head off, like when I'm working on things is that I cut the head off because the head needs more detail um, and then keep it separate from the body because basically all these body polygons are also being counted in that as well. So I'm at a lower resolution than I could be. So just keep that in mind when you're doing these is sometimes it's a good idea to do the head and the body separately and just merge them afterwards. But for now, I think it's okay. Okay, so we'll leave that for right now for his eyeball. Usually I just leave one in. Uh, because in other applications I can mirror the eye over and it's not a huge deal. So right now I'm just gonna leave it like that. So one eye in, one eye out. I'm gonna go back and work on his mouth a little more. And this is kind of how I work uh, when I sculpt. Like um, I kind of jump around the body a little bit. Like I'll work on one thing at some point and then come back. And that's deliberate. Um, I don't wanna work on anything too much. Like I don't wanna build anything too detailed because um, it means I'm neglecting detail somewhere else. 
So in that case, like, um, like I want to kind of build everything up at the same time. I don't want to spend too long on just his eyes or too long on just his like hands or anything. I kind of want to work everywhere if I if I can. Okay, so I'm going to grab my brush. First, I think I'm going to grab my crease. And I might not have enough geometry to actually do his mouth right now, but I want to see. Let's go up to two for starters. I kind of like the sunken lip look. I feel like this is kind of looking like an old goblin. If we wanted to, also, uh, real fast, I am jumping around, but if you wanted to, you could also um, paint him. You know, like if you're weirded out that he's looking, you know, like flesh colored the whole time when goblins are obviously green. I could also go in, grab a paintbrush. This one's worded appropriately. Oh, let me use my mouse for a second. Make him golden. No. Then go in, grab like a green. Yeah, something like that. Grab like a green and I could paint him with it. Yeah, shiny gold goblin. It's always funny because it defaults to that. Like with the 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 uh, albedo roughness and metallic values are um, just other ways of kind of talking about how the surface scatters light. So like, you know, if your roughness is really low, you have a very smooth surface and it's more reflective. Um, if it's metallic, obviously it'll be more reflective than a non-metallic surface. Um, so that's just a quick, you know, and then the albedo is your color. Uh, yeah, it's an interesting default, absolutely. I like it, it's, it gives it some character. But then you can go in with your paintbrush and you can do a couple of things. Um, bu, 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 bu. I thought it had a flood option, but it looks like it does not. Oh yeah, paint all right there. So you can just take your paint all option if you want to, and then go from there. And now you kind of, uh, you know, kind of see the shot of the goblin as he would be probably painted. Um, so that's an option. But if you don't want to do that, you can always just turn off uh, the PBR and go to your matte cap. So we'll leave him like that as well. Okay, cool. So I was working on his mouth. We'll go back to it after my uh, tangent, but just to show you, it doesn't do too much for 3D printing. Um, how does the channel writing work? Uh, I don't know what it's built on top of. So like, I'd have to see, like, see and showcase it. Um, this person, uh, I believe their names, hold up, I can find out real fast. It's Stephanie. Stephanie Gen Genier, I think, is how it's pronounced, but they have a whole blog that you can look up where they just like do projects like this. And like they'll do a lot of um, like sh kind of showcasing uh, like how they create programs like this. And it's great that they do, like that they can just create this for free and that anyone can use it. But yeah, but I'm not sure what the application is built on top of. I think C Sharp's a good guess, but I'm not certain. Yeah, no, it's awesome. Like, uh, like it's usually like these kind of free sculpting applications are someone's pet project, and then they're just like, just thrown at it, and then it's just it's crazy. And then they make them available, and we are grateful, you know, because it's actually hard to find, you know, quality uh, sculpting free sculpting apps. So, yeah, everyone is grateful for these developer sacrifice. Real fast, I'm gonna grab my crease brush. Mm, no, let's grab the brush brush. And then make sure my intensity is a little higher. I'm going to kind of carve in here. It doesn't have to be anything super crazy. Uh, a lot of times subtler is better. But again, we're doing 3D printing, so you got to make those details pop. So it's like, it's, it's always kind of a contradiction here, right? Because if I wasn't 3D printing, it would be better to be more subtle when you work on it. But because we're 3D printing, you've got to be a little, a little more aggressive. So kind of goes both ways. Okay. 
If he was a human, I'd push his lips out more, but I kind of like this, actually. I think this looks pretty goblin-y. Um, and then right here, we're going to add some, I believe they're nasolabial folds. That might be wrong. That might be the ones. That, no, those are the ones that come down from here. I forget what this one's called. But, you know, you have a channel that governs down from your nose, and that's basically what we're adding in here. I'm just going to push this in. I love the matte cap, but one second. Yeah, there we go. Need a little more contrast. Okay, and then we're going to grab our move brush and push this around. Again, this is something I do a lot. I might also bring his blips out a little more. We'll see. Uh, this is something I do a lot. I put in the details and then I push them out. So like details go in, but then I have to actually like position them where they need to go. So you'll see me all the time. Like I'll sculpt something in and then I'll have to push it around to make sure it goes to the right place. Man, that's a very different, that's a much more, I feel like that's a much more attractive goblin than he was just a second ago. Just from like, just like adding fullness to the lips. It's pretty funny actually. We can go back in later and change it if we want to, but for now I think it's fine. Okay, cool, cool. Um, And I think for this point, like for most intents and purposes, if I was just making like, you know, a tiny goblin, just like, you know, kind of to sculpt, like if I needed a bunch, like this would be an okay place to be. Yeah, a lot younger too. Yeah, I mean, like, it's just like, that just goes to show like the features, you know, like when you do your face and anything, like one feature can have like a huge change on how you look, you know, like by thickening his lips, you know, like he looks much younger at this point, uh, more attractive, I guess, like in my, in my opinion, uh, of course, uh, beauty and attractiveness is relative, but you can just change so much of a person's appearance just by tweaking just like one, one part of their face. Um, this is also bothering me. Notice his head, we kind of have this, um, like his cheekbone up here, but then he's also just got this lump right here on his head. That's not how that should be. So I'm going to go here and clean this up a little bit. Let me make sure. We'll step down. Again, if you're making big changes like this, it's best to do it in a lower subdivision level. And then I'm also going to grab my flatten brush and just showcase something we can do here. So we can also knock things down with this as well. And then again, always after this, we're just smoothing it out. Yeah, that's a bit better. And like, this is just something like anyone can do at any point. Just look at what's there and like, does that look better? If it does, you're probably on the right track. We're also gonna add a little bit of a jaw because we're going all in on making him an attractive goblin now, I guess. And again, if you need like a fine line, like this jawline right here, just draw a stroke, but only smooth out the top of it. Like only smooth one side. And that's how you get like these sharp cuts in here that fit pretty easily. So draw a stroke, standard brush stroke, but only smooth one side of it. Okay. I'm just taking a look real fast. That's pretty good. What time are we? We've got about 10 minutes left. Okay. We could go in, we could do some um, shoe stuff, but again, I think that's something that we'd want to do in another 3D app, um, more or less, but like for organic stuff and then the stuff that we've reached. I actually got this done faster than I thought I would. Uh, usually I have to do a lot more like guess and check. Uh, things that can be touched up, his hands. His hands are pretty simple right now. We could do some work there. This is more anatomy stuff, but um, I can show you some like tips and tricks about hands as well. All right, cool, let's see. So go to your brush brush. So one thing is that your hands are actually pretty blocky. Like his hands are very soft right here. Um, so they've actually got a lot of muscle in them. And this is something that I encourage you to look at reference for, but let me just see if I can get this going. We're just gonna kind of block out some shapes in his hands a bit more. I'm gonna 
turn this down. And then put in some knuckles. And these are just bones, like at this point. Like your hands are like a combination of things. As is all your body, but you see a lot of prominent bones in your hands that you don't like a lot of a lot of your body you know is showcased more by muscles and things like that but your hands have a lot of active bones in them as well so you need to showcase those as well um, when I'm doing this I'm not doing a great job of it but I'm trying to make straight lines to each of these things generating pretty far down So, not too bad. It actually needs more definition though. This is gonna wash right out in a 3D print. That's a term I use sometimes for like miniatures and 3D printing, like what's, what's gonna wash out, right? Uh, so if you want features to show up, you do need to exaggerate them a bit. Don't let them, don't let them wash out in the print. Okay. Same thing for the thumb. Take me back. Okay, there we go. If you ever get lost in your model uh, in Sculpt GL, uh, just hit spacebar. That's the home button. He's floating in the air because we made him smaller, but it'll take you right back to your home screen. Okay, we'll push this in right here. Is he being scaled? Weird. Okay, hold up. Just making sure. Huh. Sorry guys. I hate saying te technical difficulties, but I feel like that's what this is. So like all I am all I'm doing right now is like left clicking <laughs> in air, but it's like relocating and zooming my camera. So bizarre. One sec, let me do a quick reset. Not of the program, just of my tools. So if I use the mouse. So the mouse is still fine. Make sure that I'm using, uh, I actually use a Wacom tablet when I do this stuff. Um, it's just a Wacom into a small. Um, it's pretty much the cheapest Wacom you can get now that the bamboo doesn't really exist. Um, so it helps me go faster, but sometimes, yeah, there we go, we're back, okay. But sometimes uh, it and the program don't always play nice. Let's see. Okay, and then for the hands, don't need to worry too much. Something I would do is we're going to reposition these fingers, which is why I'm not worried about them too much, because we're going to put like items in them and stuff. But um, if you're worried about how thin they are, like this pinky right now would not do anything. Usually what I do with the hands is I put something in them. Uh, so like a book, you know, like a sword, uh, just something, some object. And the reason for that is the second that these fingers are, you know, next to, like, let me just showcase it real fast. Yeah, I've got five minutes. So let me just throw a cylinder in here, just as an example. So I'm just gonna go to my transform tool scale this down kind of bring it over to his hand just to kind of show what I'm talking about I'm also going to save this I think because I do want to come back to it but the second they have an item in their hand and this is just a very good tip or trick to use anytime you're like 3D printing anything with small like features like that. So let's scale it down a little more. All of a sudden, uh, as soon as you have an item in the hand and the fingers are resting directly on that item, um, you now have an object where you have taken all of those thin shapes 
and taking them from features of the 3D print to like, uh, or taking them from like standalone, like need support objects to now they are just like a bump on top of this larger cylinder. So like this is super important, I feel like as when you're doing anything like thin like this, because like it just gives you so much more area to work with, you know, like when you're putting fingers and stuff on when you're 3D printing. Like now, which was what was, you know, once a probably unprintable feature because it was too thin. Uh, now that it has this area to rest upon and print up from, again, as long as they are flush with the surface, um, you know, now it, this has suddenly just become much more printable. So for most of the stuff like this, I make sure that there's something in their hand. I make sure that their hand is in contact with the surface. So like, I would just grab my move brush like here and just make sure that it's touching. This is an important part. Grab my move brush like this, make sure that it's touching. And now all of a sudden, you know, like, you know, which was once a very thin overhang is now like a, a much more secure piece. I would also make sure that this object was more in his palm. So I'm just gonna move this up a little bit. Cause I want everything to be in contact with this, this piece he's holding. Um, because everything can rest on there and it has suddenly has a much thicker, much more solid base to print in. So um, just something to keep in mind, like that if you're ever worried about these, you know, like small features, uh, just make sure that you can brace them against something and it's something that you can do. Okay, so we are getting close to the end of time. I'm not gonna call it as done quite yet, but I did wanna just take a few minutes at the end to thank everyone for coming out. Um, I will be continuing this series with the same model, so we'll kind of jump forward a little bit. I might do some more touching up of the piece before I come back next week at the same time. Um, but just keep in mind that uh, sometimes I hate it, you know, like when tutorials do this, it's like, okay, I've gotten you to this point, but uh, like we'll come back next week and take a look and then like the model looks completely different you know and it's like what did you do um really all i'm gonna do is just kind of the same things i set up before you know like i might just you know add a little more detail to the face i might get the fingers uh, a little more refined but it's really just detailing at this point so um if you just take the same steps i did before and just keep pushing them further you know like if you think you've detailed you know the shirt enough you know with your cloth sculpt or whatever uh, try to push it a little further, you know, like, like, well, can I add another wrinkle, you know, can I make this, um, this fold any deeper or more shallow, you know, can I make it stand out more? And kind of challenge yourself to push out features if you can, because, um, especially for 3D printing, you know, like, the more prominent features are, the better. So, these are just the things that I would encourage you to do, and thank you guys so much for tuning in. Um, I'll be back here for part two, where I'm going to kind of go through some prop creation. We're going to give him some things to actually hold instead of just basic cylinders. Um, I'll show you how to base them, you know, like put them on a base, make sure everything looks good, and also show you how you can cut them up, you know, if you need to. Uh, because sometimes, although 3D printers are, you know, great for a lot of things, sometimes it is better to separate the model out into pieces uh, before you go from there. So I'll show you kind of the more technical aspects you need to do in order to make an object printable and some, you know, shortcuts and things like that. But thank you guys so much for tuning in. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, give me some suggestions. And thank you so much for moderating. All right, I think we're going to go ahead and tune out. Thank you guys so much for checking it out.